Hi everyone, welcome back to the 17th episode of Sound On. So this week we'll be touching on making moral decisions, choosing between right or wrong, and of course the grey areas, right? We love talking about grey areas in this podcast. And before we get the ball rolling, we're happy to welcome Dominic here with us. So Dom, would you like to you know, give a short introduction about yourself to the listeners? Yes, uh, thanks Melissa. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank Melissa and Chris for inviting me. Uh, it's, this is a very exciting topic, I love it. So I, I'm very happy to you know, be able to talk about this with someone else. Um, so yeah, I'm Dominic, I'm currently in my final year, my third year of law at Queen Mary University of London. Um, well, related to this topic, in, in my free time, I do read a bit of uh, classical ethics, philosophy, religion. Uh, this is sort of like my side hobby. Um, uh, currently in my law degree, I'm studying jurisprudence, which is legal theory, the philosophy of law. Uh, so that there we also touch on quite a bit on you know like natural law, legal positivism, the overlap between law and morality, whether it should be separated, whether it should be you know sort of connected. So these are sort of the things that I've been uh, studying and thinking about in recent times. So that's my short little introduction. And in my free time, obviously, I don't, I'm not that boring. Okay, I also, uh, you know, I, I play guitar also. Uh, that's that's, what, they, that's what they all think about us when, when we study like philosophy and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good yeah. to make the disclaimer. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I don't sit around and read boring books all day. Uh, but yeah, uh, music is also one of my hobbies. Um, yeah. Great. Mm, okay. Yeah. Interestingly, so Dom and I are both from MCKL, right? But I don't know why, for some reason, like we—I don't think we've ever talked before in MCKL, right? No, I don't think so. Yeah, but we actually met last year during an event. So, yeah. So thank you so much for making time for you know for this filming and all that. Even though I'm sure you're busy with your assignments. So, yeah. So to get started, um. So yeah, just a disclaimer, I know nothing about like philosophy and stuff. I don't even know why why I proposed this episode <laughs> when I know nothing about it. But Dom um has like according to the outline outline that he did for this episode, he knows quite a lot. So and then Chris also you you also do a bit of philosophy in your course, right? Yeah, I mostly do political theory, yeah. Okay. I've, I've had a bunch of that every year, but um so I do have a bit of background on these things, but I will try to utilize them in this episode. <laughs> yeah, I, I will try my best to. <laughs> so, yeah, so to get started, Dom, do you want to, like, you know, kick it off? Yeah, so basically, uh, what I'll do, uh, just to sort of give a bit of structure for, for the listeners, um, I will just sort of uh, build up some of the explanations be- behind moral decisions. So uh, quite commonly, what people will do is sort of put the put the cart in front of the horse. You know, they just want to jump straight to the to the gray areas. You know, but you know, in order to answer the gray areas with more certainty, uh, there there needs to be an appreciation or an acceptance of more fundamental things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, the best way to to talk about this is to sort of address the fundamental things, things we mostly, at least in uh, at least most of us would agree on, uh, and then discuss a bit more about that. And then once we have that, you know, foundation, that gives us a springboard to answer the, the harder questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. So unless you have any questions, I I guess I'll just start first. <laughs> No, no, no. Yeah, no you could, yeah. You, you could start. Okay. First. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, by by the way, if I'm not looking at the camera, I'm looking at my notes up here. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, because it's a bit hard to keep track. Uh, so, when we talk about uh, moral issues, uh, good and evil, and all of that, there, there, are, there are these sort of fundamental principles. Uh, but before we even get to the fundamental principles. There are certain things that uh, sort of ground rules, so to speak. So mm-hmm. there is very much a difference between being able to do something and whether you should do it. Yes. Yeah, I repeat that again. There's a difference between whether I'm able to do something versus whether I should do it. 
So a very simple example is, should I, sh can I take up, pick up this crying baby and slap it a few times? Yes, I can. <laughs> I physically can, you know. Uh, but whether I should, no. Obviously, the, the baby is you know, hungry or it doesn't understand or, you know, it's frustrated or whatever. So there's a very, there's, these are two very different things. So there are a lot of things, especially in the gray areas, we are very much able to do, you know, especially with the advent of science. Uh, but whether we ought to do them is a separate question. Okay, so that's the first one. Uh, the second thing is, uh, when we talk about morals uh, and these virtues and all of that, good and evil, we are talking about things that are quite intangible. Yeah, they're quite abstract, so, basically. Yeah. yeah, they're quite abstract. You know, you, you can't really study them. You can't apply the scientific method in the, not, in the normal way mm -hmm. to, to deduce certain conclusions uh, about, uh, about moral truths. Okay, so uh, usually moral arguments or discussions break down when, because of the current uh, mode of modern thinking, which is, uh, yeah, if you want to put it in a broader sense, which is sci scientism. So mm -hmm. people would say, well, yeah, maybe I would say murder is wrong. You might agree. Uh, someone else might not agree. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't really matter because we don't really know for sure. And the only thing we can really know about life is in science. So anything that's not in science, we should just either discard altogether or we should just, well, you know, it's there. You know, you want to believe, you don't believe, that's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why is this uh, problematic? Okay, when, when we talk about, I mean, I mean, if you go about your daily life, it's, it's almost impossible to use moral language. You know, even in, even in like, uh, let's say you're cooking, uh, and then you're, you're doing, you're, you're cooking the, uh, or you're following the recipe in the wrong way, and say, oh no, you shouldn't do that. When you say should, you imply there's some sense of morality, you know, there mm -hmm. or your friend is like saying um well it's an online exam for example you know the university might say you are not allowed to discuss and then people will discuss you know well should we have a discussion mm -hmm. ought we to do it or not certainly we can but should we so the the the, the language of morals comes up very much in our daily speech yeah I think should even, do that, even, you even, even without us realizing it i think yeah because yeah. I think what you're trying to assert over here is that should or ought questions are, are, are kind of like things that allows room for like discussion, isn't it? Yeah, in a sense, basically, because, uh, you know, these are quite open-ended in a sense. Mm -hmm. you know, what, yeah. Uh, what someone would say you should do might be different from what someone else would say you should do. Uh, I, and do you think like scientism allows that to actually take place? Um, because um, like, you know, scientific methods obviously have like their specific steps and all that. You have to do this, you have to identify something and all that. And then from a philosophical perspective, or even like say in political perspectives, for example, they've often argued that, you know, scientific methods is not really applicable because they at times don't really consider um, things such as morals, for example. So, so do you think yeah. that is why, um, um, do you think that scientism basically is actually problematic for society then? It is problematic because, you know, people uh, generally, they say, yeah, yeah, I totally agree with scientism and all that. Mm -hmm. But if you take scientism in its purest form, not only, you know, can you, you are, not only are you not able to say that, no, murder is wrong, you shouldn't even enforce it. Because yeah. science doesn't tell you whether murder is wrong. Mm. So, mm. True, true, true. you know, if you want to take it in its purest form, so actually people actually do believe in scientism, but in a, in a sort of diluted form. They say, yeah, I agree in scientism, but you shouldn't steal my things. <laughs> mm. So it's like, oh wait, yeah. so do you believe in scientism or do you not? <laughs> this, this is an interesting point which I never really thought about because I think the, the crux of what you're saying is basically that um, science doesn't really um, dictate what is what is permissible and what is not basically right it's more it's mostly yes. like maybe yes. 
outcomes and stuff like that. Whereas when it comes to morals and all that, the reason why it is the basic foundations of like the basic foundation of human life is basically it kind of like gives us some sort of a conscious conscience to do what's right and what's wrong. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is obviously why I think this is actually a very important topic, you know. Uh, I think people, you know, on that point, people tend to uh, misunderstand uh, people who are sort of against scientism. Well, we're not against it, you know, we're not against science, okay? So moral philosophers are not against science. Yeah. You know, they are existing on totally different levels, you know. We are... We are talking about science, you are talking about the observable world, the natural world, the world around us in its mm-hmm. tangible form. You are talking mm-hmm. about morals, these are intangible. So why do you want to look for a physical proof of something that's not physical? It's like trying to dig in the ground and look for the moral truths. <laughs> no, you, you're just not going to find moral truths in the ground. You know? okay. mm. Yeah, uh, because, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem like scientism and the, the thing that you're saying about like, you know, finding truth and all that, right? I mean, I think one thing that is a problem with scientism as well in terms of like morals and all that is that sometimes because it's so scientific, right? It fails to recognize that, you know, um, society's um, human instincts and all that is actually so various. It's unique to each scenario. So which means that when, when you have this very rigid sort of like um, um, understanding of the or, or methods of like identifying things, that's where like it, it could lead to problems, I think. So that's basically like the core of why um, yeah. scientism is probably problematic in some regards. At least the pure form, not the diluted one. Yeah. So I think in a lot of uh, in a lot of uh, theories, scientism, maybe even political theories, you know, mm-hmm. we might, in its purest form, we might uh, be against socialism, for example, or Marxism, or communism, or whatever. But then, if you take it in its a diluted form, or you take certain aspects of it, it's not, it's not really socialism or Marxism anymore, you know. But anyway, mm-hmm. I'm digressing. Uh, what you mentioned about, you know, the, the variety of humans, you know, different cultures, experiences, and all that, that brings me to my second point, mm-hmm. which is that uh, when we talk about the human mind, the human person, we are talking about someone with dreams, aspirations, hopes, fears, uh, hates, loves, uh, mm-hmm. and all of that. Okay, mm-hmm. the, the the human person is very you know complex. You know, it's not. Weird. So people would say, well, perhaps uh, Melissa, your your experience with your significant other, even if you don't have one, but as an example, <laughs> your experience. Uh, if you experience love, oh yeah, you know maybe it's an experience, but actually it's just chemicals doesn't really mean anything so when you have a child and you have love for this you know new child that you gave birth to uh well it doesn't mean anything it's just a collection of you know uh, uh bodily chemicals that are reacting and making you feel good uh, that's all mm. it is mm. but you know it's a very it's a very dry <laughs> way to live your life like to be real to be honest yeah. yeah true true no one really thinks that way and I, I was reading a book. Uh, I read a book. Uh, I only read it halfway, but it, the book is split into two parts. Uh, it's written by this philosopher. Not philosopher, sorry. This psychologist. His name is uh, Viktor Frankl. I'm not sure you've heard of him. No. But uh, his, his book is called A Man's Search for Meaning. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he, he, was, he was a prisoner in Auschwitz, a concentration camp. Uh, and he he uh, analyzed how people sought survival in these camps. You know, even in the even when everything is taken from you, your property, your rights, you don't have anything except maybe the thin layer of clothes that's on you. Even then, you know, man has a strong sense of purpose of life. They want to ascend to something higher. Life means more than that. I mean, because mm-hmm. life means more than that. That's why I'm not inclined to just give up hope even though my captors are abusing me or have taken away my rights. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for, for Viktor Frankl, his, his purpose, his, his ulterior purpose, was knowing that his wife is out there. She wasn't in a camp. You know, she was out there, alive, possibly somewhere. He didn't know. But, I mean, it's impossible to know. 
Uh, but mm. when he was liberated, he managed to survive until uh, until the liberation. Uh, and he found out that his wife already had already died. She was killed. Oh shit! Uh, but you know, this sort of highlights uh, a certain depth in the human mind, in the human soul. That all of us, even though we might not totally agree, but we all know that there is maybe there is a higher meaning in life. Maybe mm-hmm. it could be love with your spouse. Uh, it could be for some people it might be religion, God, you know. For some people it might even be saying, well, having a professional career perhaps, or a family. So there, there is a sort of diversity in thought about you know what life is. But on the whole, humans can agree, in general, that there are certain things beyond you know the, the tangible world this this concepts about the meaning behind life we are all searching for meaning yeah i mean like having a strong i mean th- this is the kind of point that is is brought up very often when it talks about when when we talk about like the purpose of life right you know what guides our life what guides our motivation to live for example so and like you brought up like that is the depth of like you know of like the human mind basically the ability to basically um, identify like what are we living for and so I, I just want to like get your thoughts then like do these underlying values for example does it does this or purpose in life does it lead to the development of ideas um values or even like a conscience for example of like what is good um like your perspective on say justice and injustice like all these shaped by um this feeling of having a purpose in life then it- Yes, so uh, that was, well, it's, it's good that you mentioned that because it brings me to the second part, uh, which is we are talking about life. And, you know, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, his, one of his important works is this, right? Uh, it's, it's not a book, actually. It was a series of lectures, and then these are actually notes taken by his students. Uh, but uh, the book is called Nicomachean Ethics. Forget about the word Nicomachean, actually, it's just a fancy edition. But the word, <laughs> the real thing is that he's analyzing ethics. And the book is about, and this is before even like the time of Christianity, you know, this is like BC, you know, mm-hmm. a few hundred years BC. And the book is talking about how we can live a good life. I mean, that, that's something we can all also agree on. You want to live good lives. We want mm-hmm. to live happiness, happy lives. We want to aspire and achieve happiness, you know. And he would say that, you know, every action, every action that we perform in our lives is oriented towards some good. So, for example, if, you know, we are having this, this discussion here, it's oriented towards some good, which is, that, you know, perhaps other people can listen to it and form their own opinions and you know have civil discourse if i go down to sainsbury's and you know do my grocery shopping it's oriented to to some good which is to to buy food and i so i can cook it and i can eat it for my nutrition mm-hmm. uh, uh, of course there are some things which might entail some suffering for example if i'm studying jurisprudence which, which is extremely hard and hard to understand <laughs> uh, you know, I'm suffering a bit in some way, but I know there is some good coming out of it, even yeah. if it's a bit. Which makes me feel like want to um, bring in Mel into this. Then, since like you know, the two of us actually um, we're doing um, we're not doing like science-based courses, for example. Um, mm. I like to ask Mel then, basically, um, do do you feel Dom was mentioning about feeling like a purpose then of doing something? So. Do you do you feel like a purpose sometimes, like from from doing your course, for example, despite how stressful it is? Oh my God, I I've just been like trying to absorb <laughs> for the last few minutes. But anyway, um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I guess definitely when I when I choose to do something, whether it's my course or not, um, I do see it in two ways. So one, like what is good for myself, and another one is what is good for the community and the society which which brings me to a question that i was just about to ask dom like when you mention good right like let's say you're going out to buy groceries is that good like to yourself or is it like good to the world that's a very good question 
which actually we, we were bound to address at some point, which is, that's why the word here, the very crucial word, the key word is some good. Mm. So, I mean, honestly, it could be a very selfish good. So, for example, uh, a very rich man, okay, he walks into, I don't know, an Apple store or something, and he sees the opportunity to steal, steal an iPhone. And he knows his son wants an iPhone. He, he can very much afford it, but he just saw the opportunity there. He just took it. And it, so, yeah, there is some good, which is that he's giving this gift to his son that he very much loves. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, in the wider context, we would say it's wrong because you're stealing something that's not yours. Yeah. So there is, there is some good, even though it's a very, a very small good and there might be a very big evil attached to it. Okay, now when you talk about the wider community, perhaps I go and volunteer at a soup kitchen or at a homeless shelter, for mm-hmm. example. There is, it's not so much, like, I don't really get much out of it, but I'm doing it because the good touches to other people and not myself. I was just about to say that basically um, what you're saying is that um, when it comes to the point of good, which I think is very interesting because um, it's more of how we want to view good, basically. I mean, mm. um, this leads kind of like to the question of whether or not when you judge whether something is good or not, are you judging it from the perspective of yourself as an individual or your family or those closest to you or for society at large? For example, I think this is a very, this is a point that people often don't talk about when you talk about the good. Like, what is good? Is, is good supposed to be only for like you or is it supposed to be mm-hmm. about society at large? So I'm actually very interested in um, obviously what guides these decisions. And I think that the point that you raised about soup kitchens is actually very uh, interesting because, you know, when people go to help in the soup kitchen, um, I actually want to know or we should actually be studying it where possible, is what motivates them to go mm. to the soup kitchen. Are they motivated by some sort of like altruism, for example, that they just want to do good for people rather than themselves? Or do they have any underlying interests, for instance? Um, for example, some people would question whether or not... Um, so th- th- there's this assertion, for example, that if you do good, you'll be rewarded in the afterlife. For example, some people would yeah. argue that. I mean, I have been taught that in my younger days, basically. Um, and this is the point that is very interesting because what is good is that, so if you are helping in a soup kitchen, for example, because you are, so, you are mostly motivated by the hope that, you know, you'll be repaid in the future, not maybe in the coming years, something like the afterlife, or are you truly motivated by just this sense of altruism that you are doing good? And I think some people would argue that if you're looking at good in, in the former perspective, which is that mm. uh, you want to be rewarded from it, that is morally questionable, for example. Uh, mm. Whereas latter is the only good one because you, you shouldn't, yeah. if you want to do good, you should be doing good for society as a whole and you shouldn't be considering your own um, mm. interests, if you get what I mean. So, so what is your take on that then? Like, does, the, the, does conscience actually matter in these perspectives then? That's a very good question. Uh, And to that, I would say, uh, I will bring up the classical ethics uh, point of view. So when you talk about goods, we face face that issue. What what might be good to you might not be good to someone else. Or it might not not seem good to someone else. Okay? So for example, you know, we can say being honest is good for someone else, but it's not good for someone else. I mean, I mean, honesty is good in itself. So the, the classical philosophers would say that there are certain goods which are good in themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That means if we, if we want to look for justice in society, we want to achieve justice in society, we do it because justice in itself is good. Correct, yes. And, and because justice in itself is good, uh, there is also a trickle-down effect in, in which we have a civilized society, you know, and a just society. But mm. that's because, you know, sort of, we put the value itself on that pedestal. Uh, and I think once you acknowledge that these things are good in themselves, you pursue it because it is good. 
not because of the benefit you accrue from it. Of course, there is a benefit that comes from it. But that doesn't, you know, we are pursuing it for the good that it is. Yeah, that is a um, that is actually a very interesting point because you 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 I mean you just raised something that I learned in political theory in year two that I actually forgot about. <laughs> you know something it was basically um, written by you know, this work by John Rawls like a theory in justice. Mm. I'm not really aware of that, but yeah, it's basically arguing that you should pursue justice because it, it in itself is good. But this actually also raises a point that you're talking about how you know what you mentioned the point of how. What might be good to someone might not be good to someone else, and I'll just like to uh, to move this a bit to what uh, Mel actually prepared before this, in which she 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 raised the question of I think um, kind of like philosophical question about how um, there's this rhetorical question of you know if there is a train coming and it's going to like kill five people, um, if you can if you can change something and just kill one, what would you do, right? Yeah. So obviously a utilitarian would argue that um, for example. That you you know you should always make decisions based on um, something that maximizes happiness, something that uh, ensures the most good, the most positive outcome in in all the harsh circumstances. For example, so you know if you take a utilitarian perspective, like uh, you know um, I should move the train, then I should just ensure that it kills one person rather than five. But this links back to the question that you were brought up, which is whether or not um, what you view as good might not necessarily be good. To others, and the point that I'm trying to make is that you know, yeah, perhaps in terms of if you're going to judge things based on outcomes, obviously, if you if you um, discard one life rather than five, that would be better. But perhaps it wouldn't be fair from the point of view of the one person whose life is discarded. Like, what yeah. gives you the decision to basically play God and decide who lives and who dies? So I want to like bring Mel into this conversation because she brought up this point. Like, what what do you think then? Should, in this scenario, then, like, should you actually be, um, should we actually judge what is good then, or should we presuppose what is good for society as a whole then, or should it be up to individual conscience? Yeah, I think the reason why I pulled out this example, right, because I just watched this like Netflix. I'm not sure you guys uh, watch The Good Place. No, no. I heard of it, but I, I didn't. Okay, yeah. So basically, it's it's like about good and bad, like whether whether after this person dies, they go to the good place or the bad place. So basically, they pulled out this question and then um, there's a guy who studies ethics and all that, uh, which is why I thought of this, you know, this train question um, and also about ethics, right? Those, those who are studying ethics, are they better at making moral decisions or not? So, um, yeah, so about the train thing, I think the main discussion here is that... Uh, Basically, because moral is, I find it very subjective. Basically, what's good for me, it could be bad for you. You know, so where do you, where do you draw the line? You know, like what what is good or what is bad is so subjective, and also um, um, because everyone has like different upbringings and all the different culture, which makes the line even more like blurrier because. Different people have different experiences, different point of views. And also, there's this one question that my I still remember, like, in school. Um, I think it was early secondary school. Like, my moral teacher asked, asked, um, asked everyone this question. Like, if a guy, if a very poor guy um, has a very sick wife who desperately need, needs this medicine, and he goes to the shop, he goes to the pharmacy and steals the medicine, is it good or bad? And I was thinking about it. I was like, it's bad because she's stealing. Then after that, the moral teacher was like, she, she said like, no, it's good because she's, she's helping the wife. So I was like, wait a minute. Because usually in, in school, like moral classes, it's like always black or white, right? We have all the definition and whatever. Yeah. We, don't, we don't get all these like grey questions. So when she brought that up in class at a young age, I was like, whoa, this is new. Then I realised like, you know, who, who gives you the the who gives you the power to decide what is good and what is bad because for example it's good for the guy because he managed to save his wife but it's bad for the pharmacy owner maybe someone needs it maybe someone also really needs it and he can actually pay for it then that you know then it's bad for the other person so yeah 
I'm actually I'm, I'm actually quite surprised that your te- your teacher, the moral teacher, actually brought up. Yeah, term. I'm surprised also. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've, because I, I in Malaysia, I don't think I've ever had such a discussion because that is actually <laughs> that is actually like next level, you know. Like, I mean, yeah. a lot of people probably won't be able to answer that question. And in fact, um, at times I probably question whether or not the uh, you know what would the teacher's perspective on that be. So I'm actually quite I'm quite shocked to hear that that's yeah. actually brought up. But that's actually. Very good. I mean, it's a good teacher, yeah. This brings yeah, up, yeah. and then I mean, um, you know, like you know, the thing of like ends, then like means versus ends. Like, there's always a philosophical or ethical question of whether or not, like, even like this is brought up very often in my political classes, which is means versus ends. Like, you know, is is the ends that is most important, the outcomes, or mm-hmm. is the means towards achieving the ends important as well and and a lot of people would argue on it differently some people would say like you know some absolutists would say that you know the means are most important um mm. and then but some would argue that you know ends is probably more important outcomes and all that but um what is your take on that uh, before before i get there yeah i just i just wanted to cover a bit on, on the goods before we move on to oh yeah sure uh, to the ends and then the morals because all right uh when we we don't know whether well it's hard to say what's good or what's not because people have different opinions correct okay but we can know with certainty that just because someone has a different opinion doesn't mean it's true yeah absolutely so just some just because someone thinks murder is murdering a innocent child is all right doesn't mean he's right <laughs> i mean you would say well you're crazy yeah you know true. so Okay, so now that we know, it's, it is possible to know certain truths. Uh, so the, the, the philosophers would say, uh, at least the classical philosophers would say that there are certain goods which are self-evident, which are universal. Mm-hmm. So like I said, and I have a list here, I'm just going to read it out of you. So we have justice and injustice. Let's just forget about the word moral right now. Let's talk about good and evil. Okay. Justice is good. Injustice is an evil. Mm-hmm. Okay. Bravery, we would say bravery is good. Being a coward is an evil in a sense. Okay. Uh, when I say evil, I, I mean an evil. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I won't get too, too deep into that, but there is a <laughs> certain linguistic thing there. Uh, respecting people's personal property is a good thing. I don't steal your things. But stealing, is bad. Okay, we know this yeah. to be true. You know, yeah. if I steal from you, even if you think that s- stealing is all right, if I were to steal from you, you would definitely say that it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> we okay. We also know knowledge to be good, ignorance to be bad. Mm-hmm. We know truth to be good, error to be bad. Health is good, sickness is bad. Peace is good, war is bad. Uh, being rational is good. Being irrational is bad. Honesty is good. Deceitfulness is bad. So we know that, you know, there are certain things that we can agree that are good and are definitely bad. They are definitely on like sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. And we can know this intuitively. We don't need to sit around and think like a philosopher all day to know that these things are true. (laughs) Okay. So you just know it, you know. Uh, So when, when we talk about these goods, we also obviously use our conscience and our reason to, to you know, uh, achieve knowledge of these things. Yeah, so essentially what Dom is saying is that, um, you know, things have to be grounded on certain moral principles, I suppose. In the, on the point of universal values, for example, it, it, I think it includes things such as civic duties, for example. So, you know, when it comes to civic duties, like you must not kill, you must not rape, you know, stuff like that. These are principles and duties that are non that basically non-negotiable. They are not expendable under any circumstances, mm. um, you know. But obviously, in terms of like other sorts of goods that are not perhaps uh, completely grounded on moral principles, that is obviously um, subject to debate. Which is why we have you know all sorts of discussion mm-hmm. of what is good and what is not, um, what is a what is a desirable end and what is a, a good means to use, for example. But yeah, I think that now we can actually move towards this. Discussing the ends, then, like, should they should be looking at yeah. Actually, before that, can I just jump in? Yeah. Um, yes. 
I feel like, okay, so all these like self-evident goods, right? Do you think that, because I feel like, you know, our upbringing and our background, you know, shapes us as a human, right? So for example, what if someone, you know, grows up in a completely different way where they don't see this, this mm. self-evident good as good. So for example, like maybe this boy who is really, really poor and their whole family has been like that, he has been brought up like that. And he maybe I don't know maybe he steals for a living for a living, and do you mm-hmm. think it's possible that you know in this guy's mind, because he was brought up that way, he just doesn't see stealing as a wrong. I, I, well, I would say, uh, well, I have a few things to say about this. Well, there is it is possible that you know perhaps he's brought up in this type of environment. Uh, certainly, I would say that. It is the upbringing that sort of counters the values that are self-evident and inherent in him. That he, assuming that he was not brought up in that way, he would have known. Mm. So it's like you're it's sort of like you're programmed with that. But the only way you can sort of delete the security is by installing the virus. You deliberately install the virus. Mm. So otherwise, you know, if it wasn't for the virus, all computers would be, you know, safe. You know, because they have their and the antivirus and all that. But if you deliberately go and delete the antivirus and you install the virus on the computer, well, yeah, obviously it's going to be bad. You know, it's going to turn mm. out that way. Uh, uh, but on that point, if you are interested, there is this YouTube channel which I found very, very interesting. It's called Soft White Underbelly. It's a very odd name. <laughs> okay. Is this, is this American guy? He uploads a video every day of people like you know, uh, you have prostitutes, murderers, rapists, gangsters, uh, pimps, everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything under the sun is there. Homeless people. And there was this guy. I saw this video. It really shocked me. Uh, that, you know, he was abused his whole life as a child. His, his, you know, his female family members sexually abused him. And, he, you know, he, he just grew up not knowing that it was wrong. Because he was, from such a young age, he was already abused. And he came to one point where he just raped his mother. Oh, uh, shit, okay. And, you know, he didn't know it was wrong at the time. Because, well, how, <laughs> how do you know when you have been sexually abused your whole life and everyone treats it as it's okay? Yeah. So, and it's very, you know, unfortunate. And it's not very pleasing. But that's sort of what happens when uh, you do sort of deliberately go against the values that we are instilled with. Uh, as a matter of nature, uh, so to speak. But anyway, I'll move on to the, the ends, mm-hmm. okay? Which is, which is the, for me at least, the most interesting part. So, when we talk about human flourishing, like, you know, earlier on in the talk, we talked about, you know, how we are searching for meaning, we're searching for knowledge. You know, I mean, like, the fact that we are all studying science or law or, you know, political science even, we are aspiring to some certain level of knowledge. We know that knowledge is good. No, we want to aspire to these things. Um, but then the philosophers were looking, okay, yeah, everyone has some sort of idea of what is good and what they want to aspire to. But they were looking for something that was universal. Okay, is there, the question they asked was, is there a sort of universal aim for all of us, all human mm-hmm. beings? Mm-hmm. So Aristotle, he, he said, that the ultimate end, so uh, this is in the realm of teleology, not to be confused with theology, but teleology. Teleology uh, derives from the word telos. It's a Greek word. Telos means ends. Mm -hmm. So we look at things in terms of the end. So he was looking at mankind's end. And for him, the end of human beings was to live in a society live in a community. Okay. So this, in Greek, the word was to live in a polis, P-O-L-I-S. State okay. history, yeah. In a state, you know. Mm. But at the same time, it was very interesting because for the Greeks, they saw non-Greeks as barbarians, that you can treat them as slaves and all that. So that doesn't really make sense because, you know, non-Greeks are also human beings. Mm. So he had to struggle with this. And he came to the conclusion that it's a similar end but man's ultimate end is to live in a cosmopolis 
obviously that's probably where we get the word cosmopolitan from lah. Uh, but to live in this wider state, this this universal, you know, you know, we talk about how the the world has no boundaries, no borders anymore. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people are intermarrying. You can travel anywhere you want and all that. So there's this idea that we are supposed to live in society and flourish as human beings. Uh, okay, now Thomas Aquinas, the medieval philosopher and theologian, he he said that uh, at least in his legal theory, he was looking at things in terms of the common good. So, how do we sort of decide whether things are good? Well, do they sort of orient themselves towards the common good? So, if I'm helping people at the soup kitchen again, uh, obviously that's for the common good of society. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's it's a good that uh, these people are taken care of and fed. Uh, what is not for the common good? Uh, perhaps destroying public property, for example. You know, going out into the street and uh, doing graffiti on the things on on the walls and all that. Uh, you know, making a nuisance out in public. Uh, these were these would be examples. But how do we? So, to to bring in another aspect, we look at ends, right? Now we have man's end. We look at. Uh, I feel like I went too far. <laughs> we we look at living things. Even normal living things have ends. So, for example, we look at the squirrel. Okay, squirrel. What what is in the nature of a squirrel? Mm-hmm. A squirrel. Well, it's in its nature to run around, run up trees, collect mm-hmm. nuts, eat nuts, have baby squirrels. Mm-hmm. What about uh, an eagle, for example? An eagle, you know. It's in its nature to fly around in the skies, search for prey, again eat, have other baby eagles. <laughs> uh, what else? Maybe a dog, for example. A dog is in its nature to run around in the field, uh, maybe smell things or you know be social animals, uh, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and another example. So let's say a, a, an acorn, a seed, right? An acorn, its end is to become a big majestic oak tree. Mm-hmm. So if I give the acorn water and fertilizer and let it help it to grow, put it in a very sunny area so that it can grow, we say this is a good thing because it's helping the acorn actualize its potential. It has, a po- it has the potential to become a big tree. So if I do anything that's helping it actualize that potential, you will say it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if I give the acorn poison, or I throw it into the trash, or I take a knife and cut it in half, I will say it's not good because you're not helping it become a tree. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, my my okay, my video froze. Uh, so, a dog, a dog, for example. You know those dog videos where you know they go and rescue the dog. And the dog has been chained up by its owner, and it's like he's very thin, and he's scared of people, Mm-mm. and it's very, very violent. Mm-hmm. You would say, "Hey, something is not right. This is not good because this is not how dogs are. Dogs are supposed to be wagging their tails, running around, and yeah. smelling people." Okay. For example, that day I was in my flat. I live on the fifth floor. I was walking downstairs. I don't take the lift anymore because of COVID. <laughs> but I was walking down the stairs. <laughs> And I saw and I saw this pigeon there. It was just there at the stairwell. And you know pigeons when you come too close, they will start flying away. Yeah. And I go there and I realized the pigeon was very quiet. He didn't say anything and he just stayed there in the stationary position. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, this is not right because the pigeon will normally fly away and do pigeon things. Mm. But it's stuck here because it's probably injured. Lah. I realized it was injured, you know, people mm. were feeding it, you know. So we say it's not good because this is not in the nature of a pigeon to fly around, you know. That. So we say something is wrong because it's just sitting there and all that all day. It was sitting there for days, you know. Yeah. Okay, now we have this idea. We apply it to human beings. Okay. So we have natural ends. So we are like animals in a way because what is our nature? It's our nature to be social animals, uh, to form communities. This. You know, for, for a baby, its potential 
is to become uh, a human being, an adult, an adult human being. Okay, that's sort of its end, its natural end. But humans are different from animals. Why are we different from animals? And this is where morality comes in. Huh? Humans are different from animals because we can reason. Mm, that's true. So animals, right, they are bound by their animal instinct. They cannot say, I want to be vegan. I mean, the dog can't say he wants to be vegan. <laughs> so I, a, very, a very funny um, video I saw was uh, this couple, it was an, on an English breakfast show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the couple was talking about how they train their dog to be vegetarian or something. And they were like, this is, this is stupid because, <laughs> I mean, dogs are not meant to be vegetarians. So what they did was they actually, very cheekily, they brought out two bowls. The dog was there. One had meat and one had the vegetarian food. And then they said, let's see what the dog chooses. And then the dog go and smell, smell, smell of it. Then he went to eat the meat. <laughs> Uh, damn. Was, so the, the owners were like, uh, I don't know what to say. Ah, shit. Um, but, you know, it sort of illustrates that, uh, you know, animals are bound by the animal instinct. They can't say no. Because, yeah. you know, that's just how they are. So humans, we are different. We are rational beings. We can, we can make long-term plans. We can make decisions. We can, you know, uh, perform acts of sacrifice. You know, I, we would say that, uh, for example, a soldier going off to war, mm. it's a good thing. He sacrificed for his country, for you know, for his people. Mm. And we say that's a good thing. So these are sort of higher aims that animals are not able to achieve. So. Everything okay so far? Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Very long we have our natural end, which is to become, you know, members of society and grow into adult beings, you know, healthy, strong. You know, your your grandmother would say, oh boy, you better eat a lot, then you can grow <laughs> big and strong. I mean, it's not totally true, but you get what she's trying to say, like, you, know, you become big and grow. Mm-hmm. Uh. Yeah. But, but we have our supernatural end as well. So when I talk about supernatural end, I mean something that's not within the realm of the observable world. You're talking about... Uh, uh, what? Afterlife, is it? Uh, abstract things. So, okay. So, re- religion would say the supernatural end is God. It would say it's religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, other people have different conceptions of what our supernatural end is. Uh, it's usually, usually, the religion would be the common answer. Uh, mm-hmm. But there is sort of an acceptance. Okay, we know these things are good. You know, justice, honesty, courage, bravery. So we, ha- we are in this dilemma because we know that, okay, maybe if we deny religion, we deny there's no God, you know, there's all that. But we also know these things are good. So why should I pursue these things? I don't know, what do you think? I think, yeah, I think that brings us to a question like that I thought of earlier like do we do we actually need religion to to help us make the right decisions you know yeah Chris what do you think well I think this is obviously um, a question that <laughs> could be quite contentious I think uh, for me I actually as an individual I, at least right now I, I, I don't consider I don't consider that I need like religion to tell me what is good and what is not. I think that I have my own moral principles that uh, that my beliefs and my life is grounded on. So I act according to those moral instincts. But for others who derive their um, who derive their morals or you know doing good values, good values and all that from religion, I don't think it's a problem either because. Um, religion does um, teach people to do good things and all that and if they are guided by that then it's absolutely all right but there is an underlying question there then which is if you need religion or that fear of the afterlife for example to do good then it is questionable then what is your motivation then because I, I don't think that you have to fear the afterlife or you need 
like some higher being to tell you what's good, then only you do good. If not, you won't do it because you need to be motivated by certain moral principles. So I think that, that that's, that's, there's a paradox over there. So, but the question being directed to me is that no, I don't think that, at least for me, um, my values are not guided particularly by religion. It could have been shaped by it, but as a person, they are grounded in my own beliefs, mostly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also, it also reminds me of this Jubilee video that I watched. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the YouTube channel, Jubilee. No? Mm-hmm. Okay. No. Yeah, so it's like they, they bring people together with like different opinions and then they just talk about it and argue about it. So there was this video about like, you know, religious people and those who who don't believe in religion. And then, yeah, they just throw in prompts and asking. So it, from the video, you can really tell like how people can be so different. Like, for example, mm. like one person said that, oh, you know, I don't need religion to tell me what is wrong and what is right. And I do it with my mm. own motivation. And the other guy is just saying like, oh no, obviously I need my religion. So yeah, I think it goes back to maybe like upbringing and like, other other factors to make people be like so different yeah i think um the the question really when it comes to religion is yeah obviously if you adhere to some religion you will affect how you make moral decisions right. absolutely uh, that's for sure but the bigger question is at least to me la, i think this is the real question here is is the religion that you believe in is it true or not <laughs> that's if you ask me that, that that's re- the real question because assuming let's assume that it's false and yeah, everything is just made up and it's not even true then you don't have any good reason to believe in it mm-hmm. I mean assuming you knew that it's uh, not true okay now if you assume that it's true let's say you know that for a fact that it's true it would be it would be illogical for you to not live out your life in accordance with the principles that the religion teaches. Mm-hmm. So, it's, if, to me, it's a very simple question. The, the question is to analyze whether that, that religion is, you know, true or not. Uh, but yes, I'm conscious of time. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, uh, just to sort of sum up on religion, uh, I think religion does provide certain higher truths that yeah. are not ac- accessible to reason. So we would say that, you know, justice is good. We know this. We don't need religion to tell you this. And mm-hmm. you can actually live quite a good life without religion. You know, the, the, the Greek philosophers, they were pagans. They believed in pagan uh, Greek gods and all that. Uh, they weren't like, you know, the traditional Christians or Muslims or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but they could live very good lives because with their use of reason, human reason, they, they acknowledge that certain things are good and certain things are bad. And certain things are for the common good. So we pursue them because we are good. Uh, but religion, assuming it's true, there is a sort of higher level mm-hmm. and that you cannot reason you out with your you own can't, mind. You can't discern it, basically. <laughs> Yeah, that's, which is why they call it divine revelation. Because it's revealed to you. You can't uh, reason it out. Uh, okay, but anyway, I'll, I'll get, uh, we will just move on from there. Yeah, so I, that's actually a very, um, that's quite a contentious point in the sense that um, we, are, we are put in this position where if our moral decisions, if our conscience is guided by our adherence to a particular religion, for, for instance, it is worrying that if it is not grounded on any other moral, like your own moral groundings, for, for instance, then if let's say the religion is found to be wrong, what happens to those moral principles that we have been told to hold dear, isn't it? Uh, will, will conscientiousness just disappear? So this re- leads us to a number of like moral questions, for example, then um, in terms of whether or not, like how, how do you actually address these questions? So we can start with perhaps like wrongs versus stigmas, for example. There are some things that will be deemed as wrong in uh, religious teaching, for instance, but some people would interpret it as simply a stigma. 
we don't have to go too far in, in these things, you know. Uh, we don't have to go to very um, contentious topics, um, socially contentious topics. We can go to, you know, things as simple as something like clubbing, drinking, smoking, you know, or drinking and smoking, for example, like drinking. Like that is considered a wrong for a lot of people. But is it just a stigma then that um, people who drink are bad, for example? What is, what is your take there, the idea of you? Um, yes, sir, I can go first. Okay, yeah, I think uh, from that, right, it reminds me of, okay, so in MCKL, we have this orientation camp. I don't know whether, Dom, during your time, it was the same, but, like, we had this, like, a uh, session called Matters of the Heart, and then I still remember this one thing that they bring up, right, in every camp. Um, if I remember correctly, it's called the I will, and I don't know if I am... I don't know if I'm interpreting the whole session right, but that's what I took from it. Like, is that I will is the belief that, you know, if if whatever you do doesn't affect other people, this, this is what I, I talked to Dom with like about previously, right? If this thing, if whatever you do doesn't affect the people around you negatively, then basically it's not wrong. So for example, yeah, like it, right? yeah. yeah, so like back to okay this, this is very weird but like the reason why dom is here is because we talked about <laughs> this uh, like on instagram is because he shared something about incest online and then um basically everyone knows that you know incest is wrong and it shouldn't shouldn't be done but basically i just asked him like okay i don't think this is morally wrong i i feel like incest is bio biologically wrong because that's not how humans are meant to reproduce but I don't feel like it is morally wrong because it doesn't hurt anyone around them. So that I know is quite a controversial idea. And also like wrong versus stigmas, right? For example, like smoking. So we always, okay, clubbing, drinking, smoking. We always pair this, these three things to like a certain type of people. Like, like people are like, yeah, you club, like <laughs> that kind of thing, you know? So like, I feel like that is a stigma. Obviously, carbon drinking, smoking, there are negative effects to it. Like, for example, smoking hurts your lungs or whatever. But we don't view these people the same way as people who, for example, eat fast food every day. Like, eating fast food every day is bad for the health, but there's no bad stigma against it where, where like, only bad people eat fast food every day. Like, not really, right? So that is where, like, I feel the stigma comes in and it's not just only about whether it's good or bad. Yeah, Dom, what do you think? I think most of these are stigmas. But yeah. there is a certain level of wrong attached to it. For example, drinking in itself, we would say it's not bad. It's not mm. morally wrong. In itself. Skipping classes every day because you're too drunk and drinking throughout the day at 9 a.m and being a bum all day, we would say that's wrong because you're addicted to alcohol. You're an alcoholic. It's like basically screwing your own life, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not so much that smoking is wrong, but it's become an addiction. That's mm -hmm. why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, a husband making love to his wife. It's a good thing because that's what married couples do. Okay? Now, let's contrast it with the husband wants to do it every second of the day. He wants to do it 10 times a day, every day, for seven days a week. Well, obviously, there's something wrong there because, you know, there's something good, but in the overall context, you would say it's morally wrong because it's become sort of an addiction. I'll give you another example. Let's take a terrorist. The suicide bomber. He's super courageous. He's bravery, you know. He wants to fight for his religion, for his country, whatever. But we will say it's wrong. I mean, bravery is good, but we would say the act itself is wrong because it's oriented towards wrong ends. It's not towards the common good mm. to, you know, go into a building and bomb the whole thing and mm -hmm. have like thousands of people die. So, uh, and then, so yeah, the I, the I culture, is that, is that what you called it? I think it's called I will, if I remember it correctly. I, it, it, I sort of get it. It's, it's sort of like a, it's a very anthropocentric way of looking at the world. So anthropocentric is basically very, in, in very uh, basic terms, self-centered. 
Mm. So if I it does as long as it doesn't help hurt anyone, then it's not wrong. But then it's a it's a bit of an issue, lah. Because how do you define what hurt is? So, for example, I would say that if I'm preventing you from fulfilling your potential, so well, that's sort of hurting you in a way, what? Yeah. Like to put it very simply, in an office, you are the best worker, but I purposely promote the laziest worker to a higher position than you, even though you applied for it. He didn't apply for it. He didn't do anything, but I promote him to the, just to spite you, and mm. I know that it will it will hurt your career. Well. I mean, it's not hurting you. You don't feel pain, but it's preventing you from fulfilling your potential. Yeah. Uh, so, in in the case of incest, what you said about um, biologically wrong actually it's sort of related to you know teleology again and, uh, and about our ends, because you know our <laughs> our human biology is not wired to have you know sexual relations between uh, family members, at least close yeah. family members. Mm. And it doesn't fulfill our end because you know what happens when children get born or out of such marriage marriages. You, if we do that again and again, it's disastrous. So mm-hmm. it prevents <laughs> it pre- prevents uh, it prevents the children, the fruits of the re- se- those sexual relations from fulfilling their potential. Okay, so let's say you use contraception and you don't have any children. Even even then, mm, would you say it's wrong? Honestly, we don't really need to go too far into teleology because most people would intuitively know that it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, it would, it, would, it would be considered unconscionable, actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't need to have a extensive discussion about why incest is wrong because it just, it just is, you know. Uh, obviously, that you can have a debate about it. Certainly, but again, it's sort of the ex- acceptance that there are certain first principles. Yeah, I think it's it's more of um you know, uh there there is the what basically guides those moral arguments. I guess um where are those moral arguments um based on? So you know, discussions about that should be according to that, I suppose. Hmm. Which. Like, you know, th- these are things like, you know, um, it's all about, um, you know, traditions and all that, I, I guess. You know, uh, for, for example, right, there, there is this point, I think, probably the last point that we're going to cover that, um, that if, you, you know, we, we've just touched on something that's quite um, rather simple, I suppose. Like, it doesn't need a lot of discussion, like wrongs versus stigmas, because that, that's something that we go through every day. But on something that's even more contentious, let's let's cover this a bit quickly, which is like you know pro life versus pro choice, for example. Um, if I think the point on ends probably makes a very point there, very important point there. Then like you know, like you know the the, the debate on like pro life versus pro choice, for example, a lot of it's motivated by the fact like pro creation, for example. Right. So some people are point that you know what is the ends of having sexual relations? The end is basically procreation, right? So if you let's say if you look at some people argue that's the case you know the end has to be procreation though I don't necessarily agree with it but anyway <laughs> pro life versus pro choice that you know I think how you come to that decision also don't you think that it also depends on what you view the ends are then oh yeah immensely uh, it, I mean put it very simply if you have someone who is very selfish the end of my life. I don't care about other people. They they can share my view or they don't have to. It's all right. But I am. I know I'm selfish, and my life is about enriching myself. Uh, perhaps making others poor in some way or another. Um, and to not care for the common good, you know, to just do things. If, if I have to spite people, if I have to sort of push them down in the race just to win, I'll do it because that's the end of my life. Obviously, that's a very extreme example. Yeah, but you would you would know that. Well, that's not very charitable. That's not very not very nice, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, it sort of highlights that there are some ends, or uh, the way that people view ends, which are a bit more grey. Like yeah. yeah, there is some merit to it. So, for example, in in the 
pro in a pro choice lobby, they would say the woman's right to choose is mm-hmm. more important than the right to life. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll digress a bit because remember, I remember you brought up utilitarianism, and mm-hmm. you know the utilitarianism is basically that you know as long as you secure the highest good and the least maximum happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maximum utility, you know, maximum happiness. The the father of that concept was Jeremy Bentham. And, and it's very interesting. He wrote widely. And based on his theory of utilitarianism, he also said that natural rights, and in, in modern parlance, you call it human rights, is nonsense. There is no such thing as human rights. You can do away with that. I mean, if you want to enact it, go ahead. But actually, there's nothing uh, such as human rights. So, I mean, if you want to look at a very extreme example of that, you, you could go that far. But I guess most people will agree that we all have some rights, some inherent intrinsic rights of our own, the moment, the moment that you're born. So, I think for, for the pro-life versus pro-choice debate, at the end of the day, it's about whether life, preserving life is more important or your right to choose is more important. Some people will say, you know, having an abortion is not murder. Some people will say, yes, having abortion is murder, but it's one of the exceptions to murder. And uh, obviously, some people would define murder as the killing of an innocent human being. Because we know that putting criminals, very severe criminals to death, is, yes, it is murder. We are intentionally killing them. But there is a sort of higher aim to promote the peace in the community society because uh, let's say if you were to let them out and then they might cause havoc again okay or you go and shoot another school of children or whatever but uh so we would say you know murder is the killing of an innocent human being so they would say you know the, the pro-life lobby would say that uh these fetuses are innocent human beings so uh, a deeper question is whether the fetuses are human beings or not yeah yeah, um, like about this pro-life and pro-choice argument, right? I actually uh, recently found a podcast called, uh, by Charlie and... I think it's called Charlie and Ben Podcast. So they, they, they laid out like a very very elaborate argument of like pro-li- pro-life and pro-choice. And they are explaining why like both sides don't really... Both sides are not consistent. Basically, both sides don't really make sense. So it's like... It's quite a, it's quite an interesting um discussion if you guys want to listen to it. Um I think basically he's just saying that, you know, it's not consistent. So for example, like those who are pro choice, you're saying that okay, it's the it's the choice of the mother, for example, um, whether she wants to, you know, have this child. Which is why like when when it's still a fetus, when baby is still a fetus, it's her choice whether she wants to remove it because it affects her livelihood and it also affects the baby's livelihood, right? So what this so why why is it wrong? Because those who are pro choice definitely don't think that killing a baby is right. So what makes the fetus less of a human than a baby? Mm. So it's just sort of, you know, all of these discussions um basically yeah. arguing against both sides. So like yeah, if anyone's interested to listen to that. Yeah. So I was saying that now, one thing that isn't really brought up in the debate, which I found quite interesting, is that if the mother purposely and deliberately gives up her life for the child, well, we would say, wow, this is interesting. This is a good thing, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, some people might disagree, but we would, say, we would say self-sacrifice for the good of another is a good thing. I will sacrifice my life to give you life. Uh, which I feel that is something missing in the debate. Uh, there's something to be connected somewhere in the debate with that. Uh, but I don't want to go too far into that. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there are a number of things that there was, there was raised that, you know, um, I think your point on, you know, if let's say the mom sacrifices a life for the child in like, because, you know, because like pro-life rules, for example, like that is good for not just it's kind of like good because 
she's willing to sacrifice something and then it's good for the child because the child will have a whole life. But the discussion then changes then. You know, the, the, the thing about this pro-life versus pro-choice debate is that a lot of things matters on like context and the circumstances, for example. Let's put it this way, you know. Let's say uh, um, in the most horrific of circumstances, for example, which I don't really feel particularly comfortable bringing up, but let's say a child is conceived because of rape, for example. Um, <clears throat> the mother was not allowed to abort the child because of pro-choice, pro-life rules, for example. And then she has to give up her life having that child that she did not even want to have because of a, because of a vile act that she, that she did not deserve. And she gives up her life trying to raise that child. But the, then there's another question then. You preserve the life of the, that fetus to become a, like, you know, a full-fledged human being. But is it actually good for that child, for example, in the sense that what would that child be feeling? So it's not just bad for the mother. So in these circumstances, right, it wouldn't be wrong in many of these cases the mom would just hate the sight of the child because the child, the sight of that child basically means, reminds her of that, of mm. that terrible incident that she went through. And do we actually think that that mother would be able to give that child um, all the love that the child deserves um, if, despite the fact that she has given up life? And then that brings in another discussion that, you know, um, would that child be having a full life then? So we save that child's life, life in terms of like that fetus, for example, but is that child going to have a good life then? You know, for example, with your... With I, I like would that. say, I would say that there's a difference between what's within your control and what's beyond your control. Mm -hmm. So the child who's, you know, born in this circumstance, uh, Obviously, he can't control the fact that he has been born and the fact that maybe the mother hates him. Yeah. Uh, but that does not prevent him. You know, that, that has no bearing at all on how he lives his life. You know, he's still a free right. will. He, yes. can still, he can still choose to rise above that. You know, perhaps mm -hmm. my mother hates me, but, you know, I acknowledge that my life is maybe, maybe about living a virtuous life. Even though my mother hates me, I still give her the love she deserves because she mm -hmm. you know, willingly gave up her freedom for, for me. I still love her back. Uh, yeah, of course. You, you say that's a good thing. And, okay, but there is a very difference in modern thinking about what the purpose of life is. You know, yeah. Some people say we need to have a good quality life, not in terms of virtues, but mm -hmm. in terms of materials, how, how we feel. So if I don't feel good, therefore my life is not worth it. Yeah. But what you consider the people who are in Auschwitz, for example, rights taken away, no possessions, nothing, zero. And you're treated, not only that you don't have those things, but you're treated badly. You know, so it goes, sort of goes the opposite way. It's not yeah. just neutral. The, the, the reason why I brought that point up is basically, I mean, I was trying to yeah. raise the argument of like, what is good then, right? Like, yeah. we, we presuppose that his life can still be good, would still be good, but would we be able to guarantee that, right? Because it clearly won't be, won't be easy in that circumstance. Yeah. But I think something that you can't take away from the child is his free will. His free will, yeah, of course. He but can still choose. In, but and, you know, modern debate will also raise the point of whether or not um, in these circumstances does he truly have um, the conditions for him to try, for example. But obviously, that's, that's a different debate then, isn't it? Yeah, obviously, that's a different debate. Yeah. <laughs> Another podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, perhaps he doesn't have the conditions, and so did the people in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. But he still could live virtuous lives. So you know, I think if you look at uh, how do I put it, there, there's something to be said about virtue, in that these are sort of higher level things. I don't know how to explain it in another way. So I'll give you the example of uh, Thomas More, if for example, uh, Thomas More was the Lord Chancellor under King Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, it's a story about King Henry VIII wanting to annul his marriage and... Yeah, and Thomas More refused to, refused to disassociate yeah. himself from the Catholic Church, right? So. Yeah, so Thomas More refused to acknowledge Henry VIII as the head of the Church of England. And, but that's, that's the side thing. But he, it really, the main reason was that he, he, want, he died to protect or to stand up yes. for the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, I think it's interesting whether or not you agree in his view, but the fact that there are some people 
who would go as far as defending not even a person it's like a value <laughs> they will yeah. go as far as defending the institution of marriage yeah the institution of marriage is not someone you can meet or touch or anything it's just a an idea up in the air uh and yet he still gave up his life for it so i think there's something to be said about you know the place of virtues uh, and the, the, how we you know uh, order them in a sort of hierarchy yeah okay so i think that we have reached the the close of our podcast do you, do you guys have anything anything um last words to add basically do you have anything to add mel um i don't really have anything to add i just find this conversation very insightful because it's nothing is isn't is not something that i'm very familiar with so yeah it's been very interesting listening to the both of you talking about it <laughs> yeah okay, then um anything else there? then I'll, I'll just i'll just wrap it up then so basically this has been a quite a rather one of the deepest um podcast sessions that we've had after a while i think <laughs> yeah uh, I, in my opinion i think the last one where we actually had such a deep discussion on like say political theory um, um philosophy um, ethics, something that uh, the contentious matters would probably be, I think, the one on racism and disobedience. Uh, in my, as as far as I recall, at least the last deep one. But anyway, um, so this this is actually a very very interesting session. I think one of the most um, intellectually stimulating ones as well. Um, so to just give a wrap up of this like long session, um, we so we touched on basically why scientific methods are relying excessively on scientism. Um, is problematic in terms of ethics and morality because, you know, as we mentioned, as we established earlier on, um, human nature is actually very, very, it's so various and there's a plethora of views and all that. So scientism may be unable to actually discern those differences and because, you know, morals and ethics are rather abstract at times. So it's, it's not scientific, it's not able to be, you can't identify it scientifically. And then we also talk touched on what is good so this is a puzzle basically how do you determine what is good um do you determine what is good for yourself as an individual or should you be thinking about society at large so i believe that what we've established over here is probably uh, society matters as well but that is up to debate uh, for our viewers because some people view that things should be valuable for themselves first and foremost and then we also covered about the point of means versus ends. Um, you know, so Dom raised the point of how humans can make moral de uh, decisions. They can make acts of sacrifices. So basically, unlike other animals, we can actually consent to things and we can make our own decisions. And mm -hmm. so on the point of means versus ends, then this is my personal opinion. I think that um, I would take it as means would then be actually very important as well. Because in achieving those ends, because we can discern for ourselves what is the good end, we should be able to choose what is the best means to achieve that end. Because I take it as that, you know, means are as important as ends. Because if we view things simply as just ends, it would, um, you know, it, it raises a lot of questions or as to like how we determine that this is, uh, that, that sacrificing someone, for example, is for the good of society. And, and that is quite questionable if we always consider things trends. And finally, I think the most interesting thing is that we talked about how the point of how do we ground our morals then? Should should we ground our morals and conscious conscience according to say religion? Or should we actually base it on, you know, a moral foundations that we identified for ourselves, such as, you know, things that are good because we know that it is a good in itself and therefore it has to be pursued, rather than it being something that that we need to be guided by like some sort of like um, higher being or like because of like divinity. So with that being said, I'd like to like thank um, Dom for joining us today. Uh, it's a very interesting session and um, we hope to have you here again then on something that's deeper because a lot of the things that we covered over here right now can actually be um, dissected even further. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Melissa. I mean, no problem. This is, this is enjoyable. Uh, this is very enjoyable. Uh, and it's, it's sort of like, I mean, I don't want to treat it like a ranting session, but I mean, some of these things you really just, you know, just stay in your mind and you, feel, you just need to talk about it to sort of let it out. Yeah, it's good because uh, a lot of these discussions yeah. has always stayed in like the classroom for me. I don't really talk about these things outside the classroom, so it's actually really good. <laughs> you know, we filmed this 
quite early. Um, this this is probably get money. <laughs> <laughs> 